This is Fothentic History. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Brian Young. And I'm Holly Fry. So, Holly, uh, are you interested in talking about criminal activity? I love talking about criminal activity, which is not to be confused with participating in a criminal activity. Uh, Yeah, I mean, admiring or, or, or talking about criminal activity doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to engage in any. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but I have no intention to. I'm frankly too lazy. (laughs) So in a galaxy as large as this, though, inevitably criminal activity is going to happen. Uh, Criminal activity seems to get stronger and more powerful during times of war. Um, And and what era that war was in leaves no exception. So whether we're talking about the, the times prior to the Clone Wars, the Clone Wars themselves, the dark times during the Empire, or even the more recent conflicts with the First Order... Crime has just sort of been everywhere, and criminal organizations, um, you know, do that sort of things. And so wherever crime runs rampant, a criminal enterprise will come together to make it more like a business. An illegal business, but it's still a business nonetheless. Uh, Many of these organizations are very well organized. And these groupings uh, took a lot of forms historically. In some cases, they could be headed up by families. Others would categorize themselves as syndicates. And yet others took to restricting competition and maintaining high profit margins as a cartel. And whatever loose form they took, the aim was always largely the same. To control the criminal activity in their areas and to make the whole enterprise as profitable as possible. So for this episode, we're going to focus on underworld organizations that operated through this period through the galaxy, offer their areas of interest, home worlds and bases, and some of the more prominent stories in their history. And some might be looking forward to hearing uh, during the course of this episode about the exploits of the Zygerian slave empire, but I am sorry to say that we will not be diving into them. The Zygerians and their slave empire, though what they engaged in was horrible, was technically legal because they were viewed throughout the galaxy as a legitimate government rather than outlaws in wild space. So that might end up being a future episode, and and this we're sort of talking about people who were doing things illegal but tolerated by the, the, the formal governments. And one of the largest criminal concerns in the galaxy has always been the family of Huts. Huts were a large, slug-like species that came from the planet Nalhutta. And the Hut clan was known for a number of rackets, including uh, spice smuggling, participation in the slave trade, the control of gambling on planets such as Tatooine, and their control of the hyperspace lanes throughout the Outer Rim. And it was control of these hyperspace lanes that really made them popular and powerful players during the Clone Wars conflict. Yeah, um, the Huts were governed by what was referred to as the Hut Grand Council, and this council represented each major family and consisted of prominent Hut gangsters across the galaxy and met regularly on Nalhutta. Often, many of the gangsters couldn't leave their criminal enterprises, and they would report to the council via hologram. During the Clone Wars, the leader of the Grand Council was the vile gangster known as Jabba the Hutt, who operated on Tatooine. One of the most lucrative situations that the Huts oversaw was the overpowering of the Nikto government. For centuries, the Huts manipulated and controlled the Nikto government and the planet so that they could keep the Nikto as their own personal enforcers wherever possible. Sometimes they were enslaved, and other times they were paid, though meagerly. There was definitely the illusion of freedom, though. Uh, for example, there were definitely Nikto Jedi on occasion. And eventually, this stranglehold that the Huts had over the Nikto was broken in the days after the fall of the Empire. And we're going to circle back to that later when we discuss Renivrin D's cartel. Prior to the Clone Wars, the Huts really had it easy. They controlled a number of worlds, the space lanes in the Outer Rim, and could they could really spend their days just trading slaves and gambling and, uh, you know, doing whatever Huts do, listening to bad music, I guess. <laughs> Lives of leisure in the dark underworld. Uh, During the Clone Wars, the Huts initially worked to try to remain neutral in the conflict, though the Separatists did everything they could to bring the Huts into the war on their side, going so far as to kidnapping Jabba the Hutt's son Rada and trying to frame the Republic for it. Both sides needed access to the space lanes, and Jabba pledged his support and the support of the Huts to whichever side could safely return his son. 
And as it turned out, Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker and his Padawan Ahsoka Tano were able to recover the Hutling and deliver him to Jabba, thereby securing Hut support during the war, which was a major setback for the Separatists. Um, even though they were working with the Republic, though, the Huts still weren't interested in revealing any of their business dealings with that government. So even though they were technically allied, the Huts sent in bounty hunters to kidnap Republic prisoners, hold senators hostage, and even assassinate Republic citizens in order to keep their records from falling into the hands of the Republic uh, and the more formal sort of authorities there. And mostly this work came to the bounty hunter Cad Bane, who was a frequent operator for the Huts. Another turning point in the Clone Wars for the Huts came when they were invited to join the Shadow Collective. That was an organization led by the former Sith Lord Maul that sought to consolidate the power of the Underworld in order to become a third major faction in the Clone Wars. Maul and his emissaries from the Shadow Collective first arrived on Nalhutta and sought an audience with the Grand Hut Council, but they rejected his offer out of hand. Maul then murdered Oruba the Hut and then invaded Jabba's palace on Tatooine, all in an effort to force their participation. This worked. Jabba, Gorga, Marlo, Gardula, and the other huts of the Grand Council agreed to join the Shadow Collective and offer their support of Maul in his bid to lead a coup on Mandalore. They provided needed resources and Nikto enforcers that proved useful in the Mandalorian coup, but after that battle and the Battle of Sundari, the Huts withdrew from the Shadow Collective because of infighting amongst the other members. After the end of the Clone Wars, the Huts remained influential in the Outer Rim territories in the time of the Empire. In fact, their power really grew during this time. They operated much as they always had, and they even entered into various negotiations with the Empire, supplying the Empire with whatever resources they needed in exchange for being allowed to continue to operate. The Empire set to work smashing the other operators in the Outer Rim, but the Huts remained, at least for a time. It was the capture of the former smuggler and rebel leader Han Solo that really led to the undoing of the Huts. At one point prior to the Battle of Yavin, Solo was smuggling spice for the Huts and dumped his shipment at the side of an Imperial cruiser. Jabba insisted that Han Solo pay him back plus extra, but Solo got more and more involved with the Republic. So because he wasn't paying him back, Jabba sent bounty hunters after his former associate until they finally captured him. The bounty hunter Boba Fett brought Han Solo to Jabba encased in carbonite, and Jabba actually decorated his palace with the smuggler. This, uh, no surprise, did not really sit well with the other heroes of the Rebellion, who, in ways that some, I think many, would probably consider rather reckless, uh, they paused their work to defeat the Empire and they set their sights on Jabba the Hutt on Tatooine. They were able to rescue Han Solo, destroy Jabba's operation, and Princess Leia Organa herself strangled Jabba to death. Though the other families tried to fill the power vacuum that was left by Jabba's death, there was really no recovering. And it, from that point, the Huts really faded into history as a top-rate criminal organization. So next we're going to talk briefly about the Red Key Raiders, which was one of the organizations that tried to establish dominance on Tatooine in the wake of Jabba's death and the sort of the implosion of the Huts. It was led by a Weequay named Lorgan Malvalon, and the Red Key Raiders tried to maintain the appearance of a legitimate front as a mining company to mask their criminal work. They tried to buy their way into power by purchasing weapons, droids, mining equipment, and other material from the Jawa traders on Tatooine. And while operating their mining concern, they worked to shake down other legitimate businesses across the Tatooine landscape, essentially running a gammarian fisted protection racket. At one point, Lorgan Movalon even invaded the entire settlement of Freetown on Tatooine and fought against both the local law enforcement and the Tusken Raiders indigenous to the planet. The law enforcement, led by a self-appointed sheriff named Cobb Vanth, uh, repelled the attack, and uh, he had actually set to replace the Huts himself. In the wake of an uncertainty in the galaxy after the Battle of Endor, Vanth and his associates had found an orphaned hutlet named Borgo on Tatooine, and they retained the services of Jabba's former Rancor Keeper, who'd obviously lost his job, uh, to raise it in the hopes that they could put it on the hut throne after training it to be loyal to them. But unfortunately, that is where the historical record of both the Red Key Raiders and their enemies in Freetown end. So hopefully, you know, at some point, some anthropologist or archaeologist will unearth additional information, but that's all we know for now. 
Yeah, I'm really interested to see uh, what actually ended up happening with that uh, that situation with Borgo the Hut. Yeah, I mean it's it's fascinating from from an anthropological standpoint. You know, the idea of an alternate species raising a hut to be a leader. You have to wonder how that will compare to the standard approach of huts raising huts to be leaders. Like certainly there's going to be some, some differences that are just unavoidable that would be really fascinating to examine. Yeah, no, that would be interesting. So next we're going to talk about black sun, which might be one of the most notorious criminal enterprises in the galaxy led by a council of Feline. Uh, they came into prominence during the clone wars when the Jedi shifted their focus from law enforcement and peacekeeping operations to military work with the Republic and its clone army. Black Sun was a significant player in the slave trade. They were also into various smuggling operations, but the most lucrative was illegal narcotics. Like most other criminal enterprises, they dealt in protection rackets as well, hiring lots of muscle and bounty hunters for the job. And the organization was overseen by a council of Feline noblemen from their fortress on Mustafar, although they also had a base on Ord Mantell. Feline were a green lizard-like species that were able to project pheromones from their body that could elicit certain feelings in those around them. It was a handy skill when trying to maintain influence in negotiations, but it wasn't all-powerful. They, too, were courted by Maul's Shadow Collective, and once Maul's brother, Savajo Press, beheaded the leader... They agreed to join the cause. Because of their base on Ord Mantell and their position in the Shadow Collective, they participated openly in a battle during the Clone Wars in the orbit of Ord Mantell, repelling an attack by General Grievous and Count Dooku. We have actually talked a little about it on a previous episode. Yeah, so so after the Clone Wars ended, uh, that was the Mother Talzin episode, right? Correct. So go back and check that one out. After the Clone Wars ended, Black Sun proposed an alliance with the Pike Syndicate that was rejected, and we'll hear about that feud next. And they thrived after the formation of the Empire, operating in the Outer Rim and even inside the Empire during this time. And they would look for pilots and try to forcibly recruit them into their organization, which was how they ran into former Jedi Ahsoka Tano a year after the formation of the Empire. Naturally, she rejected their offer uh, for employment. But she wasn't the only rebel to get a start with Black Sun. Both Sabine Wren and Ketsu Onyo began their careers as hired muscle for Black Sun, although neither of those lasted long uh, as the Galactic Civil War sparked hotter. So uh, that sort of wraps up Black Sun. Now we'll move on to the Pike Syndicate. Now they were a spice-dealing cartel based on the planet of Obadiah. They were extremely powerful and controlled almost all processing of raw spice in the drug trade. They operated the route directly from Kessel to Coruscant, and pikes themselves uh, were humanoid, though they had big bulbous heads with tiny faces set inside them. They were powerful operators long before the Clone Wars began. In fact, even before the Battle of Naboo, then-Chancellor Finnis Valorum sent Jedi Master sifo to negotiate with them to loosen their grip on the spice trade. That did not end up well, and the Pikes ended up ambushing sifo and killing him on one of the moons of Obidiah. The time between the Battle of Naboo and the Clone Wars was largely uneventful for the Pikes. They continued uninterrupted in their spice trade, and it wasn't until the end of the Clone Wars, or near the end of the Clone Wars, that they were dragged into the conflict. First, their leader, Lom Pike, was approached by Maul to join the Shadow Collective. And and the Pikes joined and aided in the assault on Mandalore that helped secure it for Maul. They didn't, uh, they didn't have as many of the problems joining as uh, some of the other factions that joined the Shadow Collective. Later in the war, Jedi Knights Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker were dispatched to confront the Pikes about the disappearance of sifo which had only been learned about by the Jedi at that time. The Pikes were cooperative, and they showed the Jedi a hostage that they still had from that time. Silman, Valorum's aide, uh, was the hostage in question, but before they could complete interrogations, Count Dooku arrived to murder Silman and Lom Pike to keep whatever Sith secrets they may have had from being revealed. Mark Krim became the leader of the Pikes after the Jedi and Sith left Obadiah, uh, and he was a far less compliant leader when it came to dealing with others. And it was at this point that the leader of Black Sun, Zaitan Maj, uh, proposed an alliance for the trade of narcotics in the galaxy, and Krim refused this. 
Uh, and this threw both factions into a war for the rest of the Clone Wars. And in retaliation of the refusal, Maj ordered the kidnapping of Krim's family. Now, Krim hired a pair of bounty hunters, Asajj Ventress, and an undercover uh, Jedi Knight named Quinlan Voss to recover his stolen loved ones. And, and this plan worked. But Black Sun was having none of it. They launched their own assault against Obadiah, though it was repelled. And even through all this, the Pikes had remained loyal to the Shadow Collective all the way up until the Battle of Ord Mantell. And after losing a significant amount of their ships there, they informed Rook Cast, who was Maul's Mandalorian representative, that they no longer saw any financial incentive in remaining in the Collective, and they left. Yeah, you can see, like, with this infighting between the Pikes and Black Sun, why the Huts would just be like, you know, we're out of here. <laughs> like, this, this is, is neither not... lucrative nor enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing entertaining about this. I'd rather watch a Rancor eat someone. Right. Um, so now that we've met all the major organizations, uh, criminal organizations that Maul had swept up into the Shadow Collective, we can talk about them as a whole a bit in detail here before moving on to other 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 underworld denizens across the galaxy. The Shadow Collective was the brainchild, as we mentioned, of the former Sith Lord, Maul, under the direction of the Dathomiri matriarch, Mother Talzin. And it was their goal to defeat the Confederacy of Independent Systems and the Galactic Republic and replace the power vacuum that would create with themselves. Uh, in their bid to leverage an army to participate in the Clone Wars, they first went to the Underworld. Their first stop was the Onaka Pirate Gang, but that, that did not work out well. Uh, so they moved on to Death Watch. And they would use Death Watch to take control of the neutral system of Mandalore from the clutches of their pacifist government and use that as their launching pad for galactic domination. For those not familiar with Death Watch, they were a splinter organization of Mandalorians uh, that did not believe in the more pacifist ways that the... Mandalore gov Mandalorian government had sort of taken. They wanted to return their, their culture to their warrior past. So with the support of Dathomir uh, through Darth Maul, or the former Sith Lord Maul, and his brother, uh, and then Death Watch, Maul's Shadow Collective then pressed the Hut clans, the Pike Syndicate, and Black Sun into service. The underworld elements, though, were largely a ruse. They sent the criminal concerns in to attack Mandalore and then used Death Watch, with the help of Maul and Savage, to repel the attack. Mandalore greeted them as liberators, and they were able to control the planet. This enraged Darth Sidious, the secret Sith Lord, who was Maul's master prior to the Battle of Naboo. Sidious all according to plan, came out of hiding personally to kill Savage Opress and capture Darth Maul. The Shadow Collective remained intact, though, during Maul's captivity. The disparate parts of the Collective that remained, mainly Death Watch, the Pikes, and Black Sun, coordinated Maul's rescue from the clutches of the Sith, but this came at the cost of uh, Mother Talzin's life, who was the, the leader of Dathomir and, and really the... Uh, she was really sort of the leader of Dathomir and the one offering that support. So that, that sort of collapsed as well. Knowledge of the Shadow Collective ends there. Whether they remained on Mandalore or they fell deeper into the shadows is not immediately clear. Uh, but there is always the potential to learn more on that score. Again, there are always historians working on additional research. Uh, so hopefully we'll learn more. But for now, that is what we have to share with you about them. This next one's one of my favorites. So oh, one yes. of the most... One of the most notorious pirate gangs operating through the Clone Wars was the Onaka Gang. Led by the charismatic Weequay Hondo Onaka, the Onaka Gang was a bit of a mess, though. They ran guns, pillaged ships, worked pulling salvage from battles. They made credits just about every which way they could. Based on the outer rim planet of Falorum, the Onaka Gang made most of their money pillaging ships and holding traitors for ransom. During the Clone Wars, they even captured the Sith Lord Count Dooku and Jedi Knights Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi. But somehow, uh, <laughs> they were able to maintain an ongoing relationship with all of them after that. The Onaka gang worked for the highest bidder, or on the whims of Hondo Onaka himself. And at one point, he decided that he wanted to boost kyber crystals from the Jedi younglings and attacked a Jedi cruiser to do so. But then he also ran weapons on behalf of the Jedi to Onderon and Saw Gerrera's rebels. The Empire saw the end of uh, the Empire saw the end of the Onaka Gang's prominence. However, 
Hondo was not able to inspire the loyalty of his troops that he once had, and he became an independent operator, occasionally teaming with the Broken Horn Syndicate, uh, as Morrigan, and even the rebel cell known as Phoenix Squadron. Next up is the Broken Horn Syndicate, which was a criminal enterprise based on Lethal and run by the Deveronian Sicatro Visago. And Visago oversaw an operation that included smuggling and extortion rackets. The main enforcers of the Broken Horn Syndicate were Visago's fleet of IGRM bodyguard droids. The Broken Horn also dealt in information and even employed rebel crews in exchange for information about Imperial movements and other points of interest. Visago worked alongside criminals like Hondo Onaka, as we said. Uh, he worked uh, with as Morgan as well. He also worked with the conman Lando Calrissian during his time on Lothal, but eventually had to flee when the Empire's grip tightened on that planet. At one point, uh, just a couple of years prior to the Battle of Yavin, Visago entered into a deal with the pirate Hondo, and Hondo ended up stealing Visago's ship. Uh, so he ended up having to call in a favor from the rebel cell Phoenix Squadron to get his ship back so he could continue operating. That Hondo Onak is a scamp. He is. He's, it speaks a lot to his charm that he can do all of those things, yet people continue to love him. Yeah. So uh, now we're going to talk about another criminal enterprise operating on Lothal. And these, this was called the Gray Syndicate. And this concern uh, was, was admittedly smaller than the Broken Horn Syndicate, but it was run by a heavyset human named Yahena Loxo and was run out of Ake's Tavern in the outskirts of Capital City. Uh, now, the Gray Syndicate dealt mainly in information and operating a black market in the face of the Empire's draconian rule. During this incredibly stressful time, they were not above taking money to hide individuals from the oppressive yoke of the Empire. And eventually the Empire learned of the Grey Syndicate's operations, and they invaded their facilities, killing Laxo and his subordinates, and wiping their black market completely off the face of Lethal. And another interesting criminal concern, and I, I included this one, Holly, because I knew you'd be interested in hearing about this one specifically, um, was the Rodian Junk Cartel. Yeah, uh, you know, I am a big fan of Rodian history specifically. Yeah. So they operated anywhere across the galaxy and did their best to put a stranglehold on all salvage operations. They worked to salvage ships both in space and on planets and turn around and sell the scraps to the highest bidder. And at one point, a major contingent of the junk cartel was trapped by the iron blockade of Anoat. In the wake of the Battle of Endor, Imperial Governor Adelhard refused to believe reports of the Emperor's death and locked down the Inoat sector completely. That lockdown led to an uprising in the sector that the Rodian Junk Cartel's heavy defenders participated in. Um, yeah, we don't know a whole lot more about them, and then they, they kind of keep to themselves as far as uh, just going and doing their salvage work and, you know, Concerns like that make a lot more money during a war because there's a lot more ships getting shredded t for them to salvage. Yep. Um, so uh, the next organization we're going to talk about is the Crimora. Now, the Crimora was a secretive coalition of criminal families that not much is known about. They would use their influence to back other criminal elements like pirates and smugglers. During the time of the Empire's height, they were backing enemies of the Empire, which forced the Empire to negotiate with the Huts rather than the Crimora for the resources that the Empire wanted. The Crimora was heavily allied with the droid Gatra, which is in itself a fascinating group of criminals. The droid Gatra consisted mainly of battle droids that had not been deactivated after the end of the Clone Wars. They fought for droid emancipation, and they worked as muscle for the Crimora. Their activity was limited largely to the industrial areas of Corazon in the lower levels of the city planet. The droid Gatra was actually the party responsible for hiring Dr. Afra, a prominent droid archaeologist, uh, to recover the triple zero personality matrix, but she betrayed them and turned that over to Darth Vader instead. And the most recent cartel that we have information on would be for the powerful Nikto concern run by Rin Riven D. About 25 years after the formation of the New Republic, D ran this incredibly powerful enterprise from the planet Bestatha. D himself started as a lowly spice dealer in the days of Jabba the Hutt, but built the cartel named for himself one piece at a time. He built a respectable criminal empire, but it didn't launch into hyperspace until he received backing from the powerful Axamine warriors. This paramilitary outfit... Uh, 
the Axamine Warriors, was actually a front for the First Order. And they stepped up their efforts and uh, at that point when they got this influx of cash and marauded the shipping routes to and from the planet Ryloth, as well as increased their smuggling, spice-dealing, and extortion efforts. Eventually, they appeared on Senator Leia Organa's radar, and she, along with fellow Senator Ransom Castirfo, began investigating. D used this opportunity to kidnap Organa and negotiate with her. He wanted the New Republic to relax its stranglehold on hard spice. And in exchange, he offered her a bottle of Tonnerre wine from Alderaan and a holocube of her murdering Jabba the Hutt. And it was at this point that he explained to her that she was the revered hut slayer in Nikto culture, because her act in killing Jabba helped free the Nikto people in a way they had not been able to do or uh, experience freedom in generations. Organa refused his offer and escaped, and they went their separate ways, but their paths would cross again, and, and soon. Leia ended up killing Dee herself while, es- while escaping the Axamine warrior base on the planet Cybensko. Uh, she was there investigating ties between the Axamine warriors and the First Order. And since she disrupted their operations so thoroughly, the New Republic thought it was safe from further First Order threats. Little, Little did, they, did know. they know. Yeah, that was uh, not not the case. But uh, to, to wrap up, this gives you a pretty standard cross-section of what criminal organizations were operating in the galaxy at this point in history. And this is, of course, by no means an exhaustive list, uh, because one, there can always be more that we discover. Uh, but this is certainly what we had time to discuss and what we had access to in terms of historical records. There are lots of other cartels and syndicates out there that were not so public about their operations, and we don't know of them yet, although there are suspicions in various arenas um, about what they might do and what they might be called. And there were certainly apocryphal tales of other criminal enterprises throughout history, uh, and that could be an episode on its own as well. But hopefully this gives you an overview of just criminal activity in general, what sort of organizations were out there from the time before the Clone Wars and and into the time before the new galactic conflict between the Resistance and the First Order started. Um, it's it's a lot to take in, and we covered a lot of time there, although it, may, it might not seem as that way. Yeah, but that's, a, a like we said, a broad overlook at the kind of criminal activity that was pretty common in the galaxy. Yeah. Uh, do you have a little bit of listener mail for us? I do. I have an email from uh, Jessica Baker, and she writes, Hi, Holly and Brian. First off, love your podcast. My son and I really enjoy the Star Wars episodes. And this week, we were listening to the one about Florin and Gilder, and as I listened to your history, it didn't match up to the movie. So it got me thinking. In the rest of your podcasts, how much is based on fictional history, and how much do you just make up? Here I was listening to the Star Wars episodes thinking I was learning more about the actual canon storyline, but now I'm not so sure. So how much is baloney and how much is fictional fact? Keep up the great podcasts, Jessica. No baloney. None. Whatsoever. Zero. If we don't have a source on it, we don't fill in with made-up stuff ever. Um, so on that Princess Bride episode, specifically the disparity is that you're looking for the movie, and I don't think we'd be able to to have written an episode based on just the movie. So I went back to the original source material, which was the uh, book written by William Goldman. And so all of those details that you didn't remember for the movie were actually all in the book. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, same with anything we talk about. If it's something you haven't heard about, I promise it's out there. It just maybe is not something that's come across your your eye space yet. And if it's Star Wars, um, we play very much in the canon. Um, and if it's not, uh, you'll notice that the word legends is somewhere in the description or the timeline or the title. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's our little clue that it is, it is something that, that exists, but is, is not part of the, uh, the forward going canon interconnected stuff. Although it, it may, parts of it may be at yeah. various points, but, uh, yeah, no, we're we're not going to make anything up. We're not that creative. I mean, we are, but not. <laughs> but it's our rule. Yeah, that I mean, all, the, the... all content comes from sources. Yeah, we're historians. Damn it. <laughs> um. So, uh, did you have anything else, Holly? No, just thank everybody and, for listening. Uh, if they want to. I... F- 
I was going to say, I do want to thank Jessica for the email and, and for listening. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, it's always fun. And it's it's one of those things we have talked about at uh, one of our live appearances before that that we always have sources for everything that we say, but we haven't ever really mentioned it in the course of the show. So it was a good uh, way to bring it up. So thank you again, Jessica. Yeah. Um. So Holly, do you want to tell people where they can find you? Sure. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as at surliest girl. Uh, and I'm also on uh, another show called Stuff You Missed in History Class, which is uh, easy to find if you just go to mistinhistory.com. You'll connect to all of our social stuff over there. That's real history, not anything based on fiction. And then you and I also host another one. Yeah, so we do the Full of Sith podcast with our uh, co-host Mike Pilot, which is all about Star Wars. So check that out if you if you haven't and are interested in Star Wars. And uh, you can find me at Swankmatron on Twitter. And uh, you can find links to everything I do there. And uh, if you'd like to send us an email, go to fothentichistory.com. And there's a contact form there you can fill out and send us some email and we'll maybe read it on the show. And uh, if you've got ideas for episodes you'd like to see, feel free to send them. I don't guarantee that we'll get to all of them, but we will take them into account and see what we can do. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter at Fothentics, and you can find us on Facebook at Fothentic History. And you can rate and review the show anywhere podcasts are found. Wherever you listen to it, uh, you can do that. Anything else, Holly? Nope. Well, I guess that's it then, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, until next time, uh, we will uh, we'll sign off. <laughs>